Section three of the Mystery of the Ocean Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mystery of the Ocean Star by W. Clark Russell. Section three. Thirst, an ocean incident. A passenger's story. It was the twentieth day of the calm, of a calm so breathless, so hushed, so death-like, that the like of it is unimaginable by the mind to whom the fancy of the ocean comes as a vision of eternal restlessness. Day after day, for twenty days, had the vast plain of the deep spread steeping into the hot blue atmosphere of the horizon, staring up at the brassy heavens like a great eye without the faintest stir of cat's paw to tarnish it with a shadow and without further life in it than a slow long sickly swell like the languishing heavings of a dying breast upon which our brig rolled with horrible regularity swaying with the punctuality of the pendulum swing to and fro to and fro a dreary sweep of the white buttons of her trucks athwart the central pouring glory of the noontide sky or across the hovering silver sheet of stars which whitened the indigo heavens from rim to rim when the last rusty tinge of sunset had melted out into the western gloom we were bound to kingston jamaica twas many years ago when brigs of the sort I was aboard of were regular West Indian traders from the Thames, carrying passengers and cargo with packet-like regularity, only that the passage that was sometimes made in five or six weeks very often ran into three and even four months. The Pelican was the name of the ship I was in. She was as proper a little brig as ever sight could desire to rest on coppered to the bends with new sheathing that flung a sort of sunset into the water under her when she lay at rest with light enough above to put a sheen into the metal the bows of a clipper rising from knife-like sharpness at the forefoot into graceful breadth at the catheads and the lines coming along like the sheer of a swan to the elliptical stem with the right sort of moulded quarters for slipping through the two seas which her speed and a breeze promised to make fixtures abaft, one on either side, she was rigged as few vessels of her kind nowadays are, her topgallant mast tapering into jong sky-sail poles, on which they would set moon-sails, as they were called, shreds of shining white cloth, mere parings of the moon that they looked, or rather as though they had been formed of the wings of the flying fish, the daintiest imaginable spaces, crowning each white spire and making one think of a bit of cloud having been torn away by the reel of the mast and shaping itself upon that tiny yard high up in the sky as one followed the swelling fabric from the whole spread of courses and topsails on to the tender narrowing of the top gallant sail royal and sky sail i was the only passenger on board though there was cabin accommodation for six or eight people our run after leaving the english channel had been exceedingly good for some days the captain was in high spirits twas his first command of the brig and he would talk to her as if she were his sweetheart as she flashed through it in long floating plunges flinging rainbows to the windward sun and snowstorms to the leeward with a wake in tow of her that swung seething with a luster of white satin over the blue ridges till the fan-shaped end of it vanished in the far-off windy haze then on a sudden some time before our stem had approached the polar verge of the trade wind the breeze shifted and came on to blow dead ahead raising a lump of sea that struck the weather bow in shocks which thrilled through the very heart of the little ocean beauty with yards braced sharp up, reefs in the topsails, the jib and staysail forward, dark to midway their height with the saturation of the brine, we reeled along, first on one tack, then on another, staggering drunkenly upon the rushing surge, with masts aslope and shrieking rigging, and the yeasty spume alongside boiling up with the leeward sends to the level of the top-gallant rail. This was very well for a day or two 
but before long it grew sickening and one loathed the sound of the wind as though it were a drunken sailor's voice howling blasphemies the captain's face grew longer every day at noon there were sights to be had punctually but very little encouragement be got out of them the lord preserve us the old fellow would cry only two miles of resting in all them twenty-four hours why at this rate would be better to up keel leg head for a spanish port to cadiz where all the handsome girls be and change our dollars into madurey and grapes and so rest joyful till this here blowing weather changes its mind why smite me eyes if headway is to be sternway it's about time for a man to coil down well sometimes we'd get a little slant the sea moderating with it which enabled us to look up to our course within two or three points but for a whole six weeks incredible as it may seem were we so bothered confounded repelled by head winds so defeated in every little nimble effort of seamanship that our lively hearty of a skipper adventured by the spite of the breeze that would again and again head us after we had gone about as though it meant to wear the souls out of the crew by keeping them pulling and hauling at the braces day and night that at the expiration of seven weeks we might still say that even should the wind shift and come on to blow fair for us and keep us humming steadfastly throughout the rest of the passage jamaica still lay a good month and a half distant time wore on and we continued shoving along as best we could keeping our hopes polished by the thoughts of the northeast trades but the only breeze that blew from that quarter lasted but two days for my part i don't believe it was the trade wind at all not a breath from the fanning of opinion of it you would look aloft for the familiar trade cloud and see nothing but a piebald sky mottled like the soap the washerwoman use with suds enough below in the arch of every billow to make one appreciate the likeness with a black curl of scud perhaps here and there blowing across it and a higher range of vapor trending westward the wrong way as one would suppose now about this time the cook made a discovery we were short of fresh water god knows how the blunder had happened or who was responsible for it but the casks in the hole told the truth and when the supply came to be overhauled and gauged it was discovered that if we were not to briefly perish of thirst all hands must be put forthwith upon the stingiest conceivable allowance at this distance of time i could not swear to what it was though i have some recollections of about a pannikin full a day for all purposes of washing cooking and drinking with a sullen hint that if our passage should be further delayed it might come to a thimbleful with a thanksgiving to god even for that blessing of course we cast thirsty eyes up aloft in search of wet weather but though it occasionally rained on the horizon the devil's luck was on the ship not a drop fell to darken our white decks with a blot as big as a sixpence i put my finger into the dew on the rail at night but the taste was salt salt with a dash of oil in it from the paint for when we got into that dead and roasting calm the brig fell to blistering and scaling all over like a burnt body with such a stink of hot paint in the air that it turned the very thirst in one into sickness i was making the voyage merely to have a look at jamaica had embarked without consulting people who might have given me a useful hint or two and like a fool had started very ill provided with private stores i had laid in a small stock of hams conserves a few pounds worth of useless delicacies with a quarter of a hen coop full of fowls a dozen or so of brandy and the like what would i have given when that calm came to have converted the whole into beer the ship's stock of drink outside of water consisted of rum of which the captain and mates drank freely and which was served out rather too handsomely i would sometimes think to the sailors but rum out of bond considerably above proof is not a liquor that cools the thirsty palate the men mixed it with water with the idea of making the draught go further but there was so little water to put to the spirit that the dose when it at all approached the proportions of a drink was as fire thirst was increased by it and the men ended in cursing it one or two of them only laying aft when grog was piped we looked out for ships 
hoping to get help in that way. But though we sighted several sail during our stormier progress, the high sea put even mere hailing out of the question, and when the dead calm fell, nothing swam into the stagnant circle in whose heart our brig lay like the ancient mariner's rotting ship. That calm made a wild disappointment for us. We had floated into it on the breath of a light breeze with a huddle of white clouds in the quarter, whence the draught came, and there was a prismatic tinge upon their clustering brows that promised to fling some weight into the breeze presently, instead of which the sea came stealing out from them into glass, with the setting sun striking a fierce smoky crimson into the vapor that seemed to make their bellies black as thunder with the reddening of their heads. And when the western light had died out into the indigo of the night, the clouds were gone, and there was not a rag of vapor of the size of a man's hand anywhere about, as you saw by the stars which went down in a sort of showering of silver, as it seemed, to the very edge of the sea that brimmed to the sky, black and gleaming as the surface of an ebony table. Well, of course, one went on living in hope, but I can tell you that at the end of the first week of this deadness there was never an eye that looked over the side at the blue tranquillity with the blinding dazzle tremorless in its heart under the sun without coming away from the sight with as scared and wild an expression in it as if it had caught a glimpse of death's own skeleton patiently floating with his mirthless grin close aboard of us in those twenty days we slided though god knows how for i never remember so much as the waft of a breath of air throughout the time fifteen miles to the bonthward as i live to write it fifteen miles only think of it in twenty days our rigging grew gray with the heat and dryness the sun burnt so fiercely that if you let your hand lie for the space of a breath upon the black woodwork or upon such brass ornamentation as the binnacle hood or the shield atop the capstan you raised a blister for yourself that gave you pain for days so hot was the deck that the brig seemed full of fire and if ever a man was rash enough to spring through the scuttle with his feet unshod he'd howl out to the burning of his toes as though he had stepped into a kettle of boiling pitch we had a bit of an awning stretched aft but it did nothing toward cooling the cabin in fact it was impossible to exit below it was not only the roasting atmosphere the cockroaches blackened the beams the place was full of rats besides and then there was that sickening heart subduing eternity of rolling with every bulkhead creeping with every separate piece of cargo in the hold delivering a note of its own the regular clank clank of doors jerking upon their hooks along with the drowning sobbings of the swell as it came flushing to the bends the stuff that the cook flung overboard at noon one day was close alongside at noon the next day we held a bottle in view for a week i'd take it for a shark's fin sometimes guessing that from the wet flash it would give holding it impossible that the same object could linger so long at sea within so narrow a sphere but it punctually proved the bottle of yesterday and of the preceding days until in a sudden fit of sheer disgust and rage at the recurrence of that signal of our miserable stagnation i let drive at it with my pistol and at the third shot shivered the glass and down it went it was the harder for the men for their provisions were of a kind to breed thirst salt beef sparkling with brine from the tierce and boiled in salt water dark and clammy pudding as acrid as the skimming of slush from the galley coppers could render it saline pork the mere measly hue of which sent the imagination ashore to the can of frothing beer or better yet to the crystal of spring water cold from the leaf shadowed rocks the captain did his best to deal with this difficulty by giving the poor fellows fresh messes there was very little to eat on board however that was sweet indeed our own fare aft was as briny as the forecastle victuals only that it was of better quality with a boiled or roast fowl to vary it our condition grew horribly serious when the twentieth day came there was scarce fresh water enough in the vessel to hold out for another week whilst a fly might have waded through every sailor's daily allowance of it 
No man had the art of distilling water, and maybe for that reason it was never thought of. It was idle to look around for a sail in so dead a calm. There were very few steamers afloat in those distant times, and the fabrics driven by wheels made for the Cape rather than those waters, and indeed no one then had more idea of sighting a steamship than of beholding the great sea serpent. Well, the morning of the twentieth day broke. The sea was the same surface of glass it had been for nigh on three weeks, but it was noticed by us, with a fluttering of hope in every man's heart, that the sun rose out of several long streaks of rosy cloud, a novelty indeed, for it had been his custom to spring like a huge pink ball from behind the water line. Though his light was as tingling as of old, we observed that the radiance lacked its wonted brilliant dazzle. There was something of a mistiness in it, and the wake of him came sallowly. In a narrow band to the brig's side, sulkily riding the roll of the swell that ran right at him, shortly after eleven in the forenoon, one saw what this meant, by the darkening of the blue at the horizon, away down in the northwest quarter. And ere eight bells were struck, our masts were aslant to a pleasant wind, buzzing blue and hot into every cloth that the sailors could pile upon the vessel. The captain had scarce brought his sextant away from his eye, when a seaman, high aloft on the foretop gallant yard, with his figure showing black to the misty blaze of the sun, as he swung from the tie, peering with shaded eyes under the foot of the royal, sent down an eager cry of, Sail on the starboard bow! and within a quarter of an hour the gleam of her, like the tip of a seabird's pinion, was visible from the deck, steady on the same direction, proving that she was either heading our way or that we were overhauling her. We were, every man of us, made for the sight of a vessel, and we watched that pearl-like shape, as one may say with dying eyes, it was speedily apparent, however, that she was standing towards us. She rose fast, showing in the lenses of the telescope, as a fine schooner, hauling the wind, lying down to the breeze in a manner to prove that she was light, and growing with such swiftness as will ample warrant of a clipper's heels. An American said the captain to me, or I am much mistaken. Why do you think so? said I. Because of the sheen of her canvas, said he. There's cotton enough in it for a hundred women's gowns. Pray, almighty providence, she be plentifully stocked with fresh water. It was not long before we had a sight of her flag, blowing from the foretopmast head that we might see it clearly, the stripes and stars as our captain had anticipated. But the stars, upside down, converted that beautiful banner into a signal of distress. So much the better, cried our skipper, with the selfishness of misery. She'll be sure to be more willing to help us if we're able to help her. But what ails her? Sickness? A skulky mutineer or two? Or something that a cask of beef may remedy? He chuckled, following on with a cry to the helmsman. Nothing off! Nothing off! She was as fine a schooner as ever breasted the blue surge of the old Baltimore clipper type, black and long, with a high bronzing of metal and a noble flight of sea-wings rising to the royal at the fore. You saw the white water pulsing at her bows as she came along, shearing through it like a knife through the satin, with a hurry of light in her glossy sides that seemed reverberated to the very height of her in the tremulous pulling of her star-spangled bunting. Our captain was in the act, as I gathered from the looks of him, and the movement of his lips, to order the brig's way to be arrested by bringing the topsail to the mast, when he was stopped by the schooner, suddenly going about, and then filling on the starboard tack with her square sails cluing up, her peaks drooping, her main tack in the act of being triced aloft, the fore and aft sails slowly descending, and her head falling off so as to close us. Will, said the skipper, plunging his hands into his pockets, with the surprised rounding of his eyes lengthening out into their old grey seawardly look, twill save us the bother of handling the braces. It's a manoeuvre to tell a man that she must be put to it, though. She was so fleet a sailor you saw, even half denuded as she was of her canvas, whilst we, on the other hand, had not started a stitch, that she must snug down yet if we were to overhaul her. To my fancy she had the look of a slaver 
but with no ebony cargo in her now she flying light indeed and traveling under her reduced canvas softly and nimbly as a sleigh over the frisky ripplings of the water we picked her up slowly gradually driving down upon her with features of her stealing out one by one the staring white letters of her name marie richmond across her counter a long-legged fellow in a flowing white trousers a jacket and a hat like a planter's standing in the main rigging ready to hail us a negro at the long sweep of tiller frequently turning his chin upon his shoulder to watch us coming and a crowd of mopping and mowing heads along the rail dingy skinned for the most part a few of them blacks and as picturesque as a pirate's company of rascals with their many-colored apparel of red cap white straw hat blue shirt and the like our captain got upon the rail ready to speak to the stranger we were likely to come within a biscuit toss of her through her maneuvering for whilst we had kept our helm amidships throughout there had been a constant yawing off in her towards us and you would have almost thought that she meant to lay us aboard the schooner hailed us first ho the brig ahoy hello sang back the captain we're nigh all hands dead men here for want of drink for god's sake spare us a small supply of fresh water the last drop was drained out yesterday as the lord's my witness i'll send a boat i'll send a boat one saw now how wild was the look in their faces clustered along the schooner's rail as for the fellow who had hailed us his voice came along with as husky a note as a parrot's and the mere hearing of him was a torment in its way there was a stir among the men as though they would get their boat over our captain instantly responded i'm sorry i'm sorry we've scarce got water enough to last us another week and an eggshell full of man at that by god but you must share it with us cried the other no shouted our captain all other stores we have you're welcome to a supply from we can help you to beef to rum to molasses but the little drop of water we have we must keep for our life's sake a husky voice from the men at the schooner's side yelled out with a tone of a scream in it we're dying of thirst ye will share what ye have with us for the sake of jesus twas horrible to hear them and to watch them to feel our helplessness in the face of their anguish and our own disappointment too was bitterly acute for want of water was the last thought that would have been put into our head by the sight of the inverted stripes and stars stranger cried the fellow in the main rigging swinging out from the grip of one hand while he put the other to his mouth to help carry his voice we're dying men aboard this craft and determined for that reason and so help us god if you don't make your stock of fresh water yield us a drink all round we'll board ye and take it for ourselves at this threat our sailors all hands as you will believe were on deck gathered themselves together as with a sort of instinct with a quick look round for handspikes or whatever else might be useful in their fists one or two of them whipping off their jackets on the spot whilst i saw another roll his cuffs up and spit into his palms there were twelve of us all told and sixteen or eighteen of the schooner's company several of them negroes as i have said with a few half-bloods the rest of them american seamen our captain bawled back sorry it's out of our power to sarve ye give us no threats we're heartily concerned heartily concerned but what can't be done won't be done and with that he dismounted from the rail motioning to the fellow at the wheel to keep the brig off a little i overhung the bulwarks looking at the schooner for my part i never for a moment dreamt that her skipper as i took the fellow in the rigging to be was in earnest in threatening to board us "'Twas a mere idle stroke of despair in him, I thought, "'and was prepared now to see him sheer off. "'For our captain, by dropping from the rail, "'accentuated his resolution not to help him. "'And besides, there had been a sorrow and an honesty in his voice "'that should have satisfied every man aboard that schooner "'that he had told nothing but sheer truth, "'cruel as it was, in speaking of our water-stock. "'But of a sudden, the long-legged man in the rigging after looking on idly for a moment or two dropped like a marlin spike to the deck and sang out an order the purport of which i could not gather the crew left the rail in a rush some tailing on to the jib halyards some hauling down the tack at the mainsail 
Their movements were full of breathless hurry, but their intentions were now apparent. No sooner had they made and trimmed sail for the maneuver that was to follow than that they ran about seeking objects with which to arm themselves, some whipping out iron belaying pins, others flashing out the deadlier sheath knife, others snatching the stretchers out of the boats. The schooner, meanwhile, settling down upon our quarter, with a gradual shearing up towards us that would bring her rubbing her sides against ours in a few minutes. Our captain stared bewildered at the craft for a moment, then bawled to the mate, Mr. Modi, we are without small arms. Let the men collect whatever they can fight best with. We must prevent these chaps from boarding, or we're dead men. Watch where she means to throw her people, and gather the hands about the place ready to resist them. So saying, he bundled in red-hot haste below, and almost instantly reappeared, bearing in his hand a great blunderbuss, with a muzzle resembling the mouth of a bell. He bowled right aft on his rounded shanks, and sprang to the grating abaft the wheel, holding the weapon high in the air, that all might see what he grasped. "'Captain,' he shouted, "'we've done you no ill. We're as sorry for you as if you were ourselves, and God knows we'd serve you if we could, speaking our tongue as ye do, and having our blood in ye. But we must stand first in this murdering business. We've not a drop of water to spare, and what we have we mean to keep. So stand by. The first man as attempts to put his foot upon this here brig, I'll shoot dead. He sprang off the grating, and then stood looking on and waiting, gripping his blunderbuss with both hands, with the muzzle of it grinning a little beyond the rail. A roar full of defiance and despair swept from the schooner's decks in response to his words. The swift and beautiful vessel, easy as her canvas was, crept down upon us at the pace of two feet to our one. I saw her long tapering jib-boom come slowly sliding past our quarter, and then, as it was no time now for mere staring only, I pulled a heavy iron pin out of the rail and joined the sailors who stood grouped along close to the main rigging. The height of the bulwarks prevented me from seeing, but I presently heard a loud shout alongside, then saw our captain take aim with his blunderbuss, but the powder merely flashed in the pan. It was the best thing that could have happened, I thought, even at that moment, as I saw him bring his foot with a heavy stamp upon deck, and catch up his weapon by the barrel with a preliminary whirl of it round his head as he approached us. There was a short pause. A dead silence, indeed, whilst you could have counted ten, with nothing to break it but the brook-like streaming sounds of water murmuring behind the two gliding vessels. Then followed a hurricane of wild shouts. In a trice the Yankees were aboard us, tumbling pell-mell upon our men, and striking to right and left with the desperation of madmen. We were not only too few for them, their rage of thirst converted them into veritable demons. Our decks were soon as bloody as if the conflict had been an action between two men of war. Here and there lay a motionless figure. There were constant shouts of, Show us the water! Show us the water! We don't want your lives! We want the water only! I hid out with the others, and have a clear recollection of saving my head from a blow that might have crushed it by letting drive at the uplifted arm with such force that the fellow let fall his handspike with a howl of suffering as he sprang at me. I dodged him and slipped, and in falling, struck the back of my head against the combing of the main hatch with a violence that stunned me. How long I lay insensible I don't know. By the time my consciousness returned, the Yankees had done their work, beaten half our men into the forecastle, disabled most of the rest, broached our last water cask, and drained it, and were now returned to their own vessel, carrying their wounded with them. Some of our fellows were badly hurt, though not dangerously so, but their wounds were of a nature to have made our brig, without fresh water, a very hell of suffering. Had it not been for our happily sighting the next morning a large sail, which proved a French sloop of war, homeward bound, whose captain, on hearing our story, supplied us with water enough to last us for the rest of the passage, that the Marie Richmond may have met with similar good fortune, I heartily hope, spite of the usage her people gave us. The thing looks dim with time, as I turn my eyes back, 
Yet, though not half a century old, it will be one of the freshest of all the memories my mind preserves down to the time of my death. To show the whole horrors of it, one wants a big canvas. The Lord preserve us. To think now of making the voyage to Jamaica in a little brig. End of section three.